Well, I created him from the ground up. He was not on the page, you see. He was not in the pilot. It was a creation of mine, and I must tell you it is the highlight of a very long career. I was given the rare opportunity by Irwin Allen, who's a strange man, my dear, but he did one wonderful thing. He let me, he gave me carte blanche to go, <laughs> quote. Hope I didn't overstep the bounds, but I went. You see, I was hired to play a deep-dyed, snarling villain who bored me to death. There's no longevity in a deep-dyed, snarling villain. I knew they'd have to kill me off in about five shows. Unemployed again, thank you very much. And I began to sneak in what I have become, at the risk of seeming immodest, justly famous for, comedic villainy, which I adore. I do a lot of, and still do. Hoping nobody would notice. <laughs> he noticed. I played it cool. I just sneaked in little bits here and there. And one day, I'll never forget, he was an interesting man, to say the least, over it was, yes. He came to my dressing room, and that finger went, oh, that finger that I really meant to bite off one of these days. It, it went, wow, I know what you're doing. I said, oh, oh dear. and, and? And he waved it and said, do more, and walked out. And so that almost everything you heard, me speak, I wrote. All the alliteratives with the robot, I wrote them. I had thousands of them. I enjoyed that. I had the best time in my life. And the character evolved. I gave him aspects. You know, creating a character is just the most wonderful thing for an actor to do. I gave him facets of his nature that became so amusing to me. I came to love him. And I love him still. He was wonderful and funny and amusing and dreadful and s selfish and horrible and delightful and delicious. He was all of that. And all of that I did. And I'm very proud of him. I am. So there. Oh, absolutely. The kind of show it was. Lost in space. In space? What did I find in space? There were monsters in space. I believed them. Oh, yes. They made me scream. I sold the boy to the monsters. Take the boy! Take the boy! But I always got him back, you see. I redeemed myself. I was very clever. But I did, in fact, sell the boy. Take the boy! Don't take me. I loved him. He was a terrible, wonderful man, Smith. I found it a fascinating character, Jeannie. I really did. They remember everything. It's wonderfully exciting for me, and it makes me feel very humble, I have to tell you. I make appearances all over the country, and, and the world, as a matter of fact, and the fans don't change. They're the same. And, my dear, I must tell you, if you think that it's bad to be worshipped and adored for a weekend, I have a big class for you. It ain't bad. And that's what happened. Many episodes, they want to know which ones are my favorite, and I don't have any because we shot back to back. Who can remember? We finished one at two o'clock in the afternoon and started the next one at three o'clock. And it was a question of, oh, my God, did I... Oh, I did learn that, yes. So I'm ready to do that. That was it. Who remembers? There were a couple that stuck in the head because they were an additional stretch other than Smith and all his crazy facets. There was a one called West of Mars in which I played two parts. I played Smith and I played Zeno, the fastest gun in space. <laughs> and I found a voice for him that was different. So it was a stretch for the actor, you see. It's like being in a long-run play, which I've had the pleasure of doing for many years on Broadway. In the third year of the run, you want to kill yourself. You say, I cannot do this again eight times a week because I'll kill myself. In a way, a long-run series is pretty much the same. You are doing the same thing every week. The words are slightly different. But it's the same bloody thing all the time, and it's lovely to get paid, you see. And then when you get an opportunity to stretch a little and do something different in the part, it's wonderful. Start with June. She's a dear, and she hasn't changed at all, I think. She looked very cute in that seat. She had a lovely bum. <laughs> She's a very, sweet, very experienced lady. Do you know that I worked with her father, Jean Lockhart, on the stage. 
in the Dallas State Fair musicals in a musical called Hazel Flag, which I had done on Broadway with Tommy Mitchell. And when we went to Dallas, Mitchell wouldn't go, so Gene Lockhart played the part. A lovely man. And June and I have talked about that. Lovely man, a very good actor. So that was nice. Billy, of course, is my buddy of the world, Billy Mooney. We're just still buddies, you wouldn't believe. And there's a big age difference, of course. But I have such regard for him because he was the best kid actor that ever lived. He was wonderful to work with. Smart, fast. And if it was a really difficult scene, I'd steal him away from the teacher for two minutes because I had a little job going with her. And I worked with Billy for two minutes in my dressing room and we'd knock that scene to pieces in two minutes. He was so fast, it staggered me. You see, I never treated him like a kid. I have never treated a kid actor like a kid actor. He's an actor. And Billy was wonderful to work with. It was a treat and an honor for me. And he one day said something to me in the second season, which I have never forgotten, Jeannie. Came to my dressing room, shuffling his feet, as Billy was wont to do. And I said, what is it? <laughs> and he said, mm, I got something to tell you. I said, well, then tell it. He said, mm, you taught me more about acting in one year than I learned of my whole life. And he walked out. That's the nicest thing that's ever happened to me, I want you to know. So that's my relationship with Billy. And we're so great friends. And we have lunch and we chatter on the phone like two magpies. And that's lovely. Angela is Miss Dreamy Girl. She's just the dearest, sweetest, prettiest thing. She always was, still is. And I had a bit running with her every day on the set like an idiot. I would say, Angela, I could on Thursday at 10... 20, I could be free to marry you. And she would say, just a minute, 10, 20, 30, busy, sorry. We knocked that into the ground every single day of the week. And then one day she would say, hmm, yes, I'm free on that day. And I'd say, just a moment, I'll discuss this with your father about the dowry. And I'd come back in 10 minutes and say, you're talking serious, cheap here. One goat, forget it. For the, uh, oh, God, to be killed if we loved it. But it was a giggle that we both needed. And Marta is just so beautiful, it hurts. And she's this sweet, lovely girl. Lovely, sweet girl. And you see how pretty she is still. She was a gorgeous girl, now she's the most handsome woman. Guy is, of course, dead, about five years now, which is very sad. He died in Buenos Aires, where he had been living for 20 years. I don't know why, but that's where he'd been. And I think it was a heart attack, and that was very sad. And when we did, I think, a 30th anniversary in Boston, I was tempted to say in my little speech, I'm sure that Guy is smiling down upon us. I'm sure he was. And wished he, w he was still there, you see. So it was a good company. But, you know, television series, it's hard work. There are tensions. Make no mistake. Anyone who tells you there aren't is lying. There are tensions. It's inevitable. But you overcome them. But you do the work. And if there's a little argument, you settle it, you know. But there are tensions, and in my case, the blinders, the blockers go on. I never saw or heard it. It affects the work. Yes, of course. We were human beings, we were actors. Doing a space show. And it was lovely. It lasted for 83 episodes, and the fringe benefits are endless. I'm so grateful. You have no idea. All the work I've done, none of that produced these fringe benefits, except this. I love you, Lost in Space, even Irwin Allen, dead as you are. And some people say not a moment too soon. However, that's neither here nor there. <laughs>